Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. I hope this is working and coming over. Welcome to the uh, Leeds Institute for Fluid Dynamics uh, JFM DAMTP uh, seminar. Today we're very pleased to have Lorette Tuckerman, who's come all the way to Leeds. Uh, Lorette is a, uh, a leading figure in bifurcation analysis for fluid flows and also in, in wall-bounded flows. Uh, Lorette has a very distinguished career. Uh, she's for, Lorette's looking at me like she, like I'm mad, but she does. Uh, and she's currently at EP, ESPCI. And today she's going to be telling us about patterns in turbulence. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see. There's already somebody on the chat. Maybe you should check and see if they're saying something like, can't hear anything. And four people enter the waiting room. Okay. Okay. Um, well, thank you everyone for coming. Let's see. No, I can't get rid of those. Uh, let's see. Okay. So uh, I'm going to tell you about patterns of turbulence. Um, uh, it's okay. I'm not okay. Yes. Um, this work was done with um, uh, Dwight Barkley from the University of Warwick and also with a postdoc that we had before, Matt Chantry, who used to be at Oxford, is no longer, and Sebastian Gomez, a student who was at PMMH, finished recently. Ooh. Okay. So uh, we're going to talk about wall bounded shear flows. These are the three prototypes. Uh, there's the uh, Kuwait flow, plain Kuwait flow. Let's see, can people, uh, which is like this, right? And then there's pipe flow. I can be seen, sort of. Yes, not really. Should I put? Uh, okay, let's see. So, this is my pocket. Uh, yes, okay. Plain Kuwait flow, I can be seen. It's like this. Pipe flow, like this. And um, plain channel flow or poiseuille flow, pressure driven uh, between two plates. And it's well known that these flows are linearly unstable and hence the main tool that uh, was has been used all these years for um, uh, predicting instabilities and transition. Linear stability analysis uh, cannot be used. The turbulence is somewhere else far away or not finite distance away. Okay, since the pioneering work of Reynolds in the 1880s, and he's the one that the Reynolds number is named after, uh, he studied pipe flow. Um, there's a, been lots of work. The classic things are Orsammerfeld equation and Squire's theorem. These deal with linear stability analysis, which, as I've said, doesn't work. Then all the things that, you know, the, the privileges of getting old is that you get to see things come and go. Um, so I've seen many things come and go. In the 1880s, I was at MIT when uh, they were studying 3D instability of 2D decaying transients, or SAG and Patera colleagues. Then I was at Texas uh, in the 1980s when they were doing low dimensional chaos and strange attractors. And then came transient growth in the 1990s um, by people like Butler, Farrell, Trefethen, Schmidt, Henningsen, Reddy. Um, uh, and then uh, also, the uh, work of Hamilton Kim Wallef, a minimum flow unit, minimal flow unit, the smallest dimensions in which you could keep a uh, keep turbulence going. This is two by four by six, um, and um, then uh, this uh, this work was done by Wallef, and then he put forth a, uh, an idea that has been very influential, called the self-sustaining process (SSP) to its friends where um, what you have, okay, I'm going to go back to the first slide. Um, you see here, um, okay, what you see, the, the main feature that you see here is what the main thing this is about is these big green stripes that are oblique and that are wide, right? Everybody sees this? Now, um, what, what am I showing you? I'm showing you probably uh, kinetic energy the mid plate, mid plate, what does that mean? Uh, in front, can people see me? Not the people here, but okay. Uh, in front, there's a plate moving to the right, and in the back, there's a plate moving to the left. 
So that's the dimension I'm not showing you, the one between the plates. The one between the plates is about this wide, like between the two green things. Okay, these are called streaks. They're a little wavy. They're horizontal. This is the um, uh, this is called the streamwise direction. It's the direction which the plates are going and the main fluid velocity is. And as you see, these bands are um, at an angle, oblique, to that streamwise flow. And they have a large wavelength compared to the distance between the plates, unlike something like Rayleigh-Bernard convection Taylor coed flow. So why am I telling you this now? These things that you're seeing that are widely accepted now to be the texture of turbulence, the main ingredient, are the things from the WLF self-sustaining process. What you were seeing were the wavy streaks. And here are some recent experimental uh, confirmation of WLF's uh, cycle that by the group at ESPCI, Yusemin uh, Godot, Diana, and uh, with Fred. Um, this is um, these are the streaks, and they're very closely spaced, uh, being decomposed into something wavy, which is necessary for the self-sustaining process, and something straight. Another recent idea, okay, this is this is now well accepted. Uh, this is the texture of turbulence. Uh, I think probably nobody says the contrary. This is also has something to do with the vortex, or it's probably the same thing as the vortex wave interaction proposed in uh, probably just slightly before we left in the 18, uh, 19, 1980-something, probably 1990-something, by Phil Hall and colleagues, uh, BWI, Vortex Wave Interaction. Same thing, the ingredients of turbulence. Another very um, uh, commonly thing studied now is the idea that turbulence is, from a dynamical system point of view, a chaotic attractor with um, unstable steady states and periodic orbits embedded with it, and that the fluid, uh, the trajectory in phase space is bouncing around between these unstable objects, and people compute these unstable objects, of which you need many to get statistics. Okay, but I'm only going to tell you about one specific thing, which is that picture I showed you, these bands. These bands can be said to have been discovered uh, in the years 2000, 2003 at Serra Saclay by Prigent and Dauchot um, in plain coet flow. And they were able to do this uh, due to a great improvement experimental technique uh, by at KTH by, oh, I think it's Johansson. Yeah, okay, who had the idea um, to have not moving plates, moving plates is difficult, you have to keep them parallel, they're big, heavy, but the plates stay stationary and you have a film on a roller that is moving. So with the surface of the plate moving, not the plate itself, it's as if the plate was moving as far as the fluid is concerned. So here's the experimental labors and that opened up uh, the possibility of uh, doing more plain coed flows and especially in a large domain. And that's what Prigent Dauchot did. And this is a picture, an experimental picture. Um, this uh, the conventional non-dimensionalization is half gaps between, I remember I told you that the one uh, plate is doing this and another plate behind is doing this. Uh, what you're seeing is now is, I can't say it's at the mid, because this is not numerical, it's whatever it is they did to visualize it. So, but you see clearly these turbulent laminar, turbulent laminar bands, you see this very large um, aspect rate, horizontal aspect rate compared to this tiny, tiny width uh, between the plates. And that's necessary because these things take up a lot of room. And if you did one of those little tiny units, you never could see it. So here's our numerical simulation superposed on the experimental uh, visualization. And uh, the typical numbers used nowadays are that there's 40 half gaps between in one wavelength. And uh, the, uh, the oriented, the, uh, the bands are oriented at an angle of 24 degrees with respect to the streamwise flow. Um, I said that Prigent Dosho had discovered it. That's not quite true because these, this had been seen by Coles and Van Atta in, the, in 1965 and 1966. This is not a picture in Taylor Coet flow. This is not a picture of theirs. It's a picture from Andrew et al., um, uh, Swinney and you. 
in 18, uh, 1986. Why do I keep doing that? Um, and this is, again, this is Taylor Couette flow. And one sees here an oblique area of turbulence, and here is laminar. But you could just think that it was kind of a turbulent patch and a laminar. You know, it doesn't look very clear. Uh, but when Prigent Dosho did a very large aspect ratio Taylor Couette apparatus, uh, where this, this little box here could be considered to be that whole box there, they saw that these this vague patch was really part of a very regular striped oblique pattern. So this was it was seen in 1965-66, but not really recognized as what it was until um, these much larger uh, experiments by Prigent Dosho. Um, here is a simulation at uh, slightly after we did a Dugish ladder. Henningsen did a simulation of uh, just Navier Stokes, and it's not very high Reynolds numbers either. You can do it. And you see here is the spontaneous formation of these turbulent bands here. And um, here is a simulation by Messiger, Melikbovsky, Avila Marquez of the Taylor Kuwait flow thing that you just saw with the oblique uh, spiral. Um, now here's a movie. Uh, let me stop this for just a moment and tell you what you're seeing. Well, no, I'll say this is at Reynolds number 500. Reynolds number measures the, uh, the Viscosity. And what you're seeing is pretty much, well, I should stop it. The same thing as you saw in the beginning. Well, no, not quite. These are the, the streaks and the roll, uh, the streaks, uh, the wavy streaks and rolls. Okay, so this, the distance between the plates, the dimension you're not seeing is about this, this, uh, the distance between a blue and a red. And what are you seeing? Well, imagine that instead of having the color coding has to do with fluid moving in the positive or the negative x direction, it's like temperature. The laminar profile goes linearly from the speed of one plate to the opposite speed of the other plate. So going from blue to red, if the flow were laminar, what you would see in the mid plane here would be all green. That is to say, zero velocity, positive velocity in front, negative velocity in back, or maybe the other way around, and you would just see green. But no, it's turbulent, not very turbulent. The Reynolds number is 500. And so what you're seeing, again, imagine it were temperature or something, and you, you have this turbulent, this motion, the one that Walef talked about, these rolls that are like convection rolls or telecord that are bringing the right moving fluid and the left moving fluid together. And that's why you see some red and some blue. Imagine these as being isotherms. So they're, the, the red is brought down from the top and the blue is brought up from the from the bottom or the other way around, I forget. And then you see it moving in this wavy way. It looks like a bunch of snakes. And this is Reynolds number of five, oh, 500. Come on, let's go. So that's what you see. You see turbulence, low Reynolds number turbulence. And this is what turbulence looks like in correct low Reynolds number turbulence. It looks like a bunch of worms. So you see it, that's Reynolds number 500. And now the Reynolds number is going to be lowered to 350. So that's the, basically the difference between the velocity of the plates. And you see the snakes continue to be, they're less wavy, they're less uh, dynamic, but you also see some green patches appear spontaneously. This is just running Navier-Stokes, nothing, uh, nothing, nothing else. Um, periodic boundary conditions on these boundaries and uh, rigid walls here. And now you see spontaneously these worms, the blue and red worms, have organized themselves into this oblique um, stripe. You see the angle has appeared spontaneously, the wavelength has appeared spontaneously. And these will just last uh, pretty much forever. And that's, that's the phenomenon I'm telling you about today. Everything is gonna be about this. It'll persist indefinitely. And I think there's a zoom out very shortly where you see this repeated. Um, where's the zoom out? Here it comes. You'll see how impressive it is. Do, 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 do. There. Okay. So there are these stripes. And, you know, they're dynamic. There's a fizzling like that, but um, basically they stay stationary, this and that. They're statistical fluctuations. Okay. So here again, the experiments, uh, a snapshot from the experiments of Prigent and Dosho and with the, with the numerical simulation on it. And uh, the origi on original feature of our simulations is to not do them in a large rectangular box, but in a tilted domain, tilted um, perpendicularly to the bands so that 
you have, um, you can have, uh, okay, this direction is statistically um, uh, un um, uniform. That is to say, this is turbulent, and this is laminar, and this is turbulent, and this is laminar. You have to have it, you can't have it infinitesimal, it can't be a 2D simulation. You can't just have a stripe there because you need room for the turbulence to exist. But we have it here perpendicular to the band. So we here we're going to have turbulent laminar, turbulent laminar, turbulent laminar. We have uh, uh, our box is like this. It's tilted, it's long and narrow, and it's got periodic boundary conditions on the, uh, the boundaries that you see. Uh, so the kind of data that I'm going to show you at first looks like this. That is to say, this is that long direction, which is not the spanwise direction. It's called, we call it Z, but it's the direction perpendicular to the bands. And we um, we are taking, uh, that's Z is varying here, but we have fixed X and Y. So we're taking a bunch of points at the midplane. Uh, this is the spanwise velocity uh, that's jiggling around. In time, we lower the Reynolds number and spontaneously there appears this, um, these laminar patches of width around 40. This is spontaneous just from decreasing the Reynolds number. So that's typical. These are our first observations and they're from 2003 or four or five or so. And here is a time series that's like that. We st start off with uh, Reynolds number 420 where we have what we call uniform turbulence, no bands and we lower the Reynolds number. And here are some questions I'm going to address. Here are the bands appearing, right? Um, and what is their threshold? When can you say the band? Because it's statistical, you, you know, is it here, is it here, is it here? You know, how do you define the upper threshold? You notice there are three bands, why three? Because our length is 120. And I said already that they like to have a wavelength of 40. Uh, we'd like to know how it's maintained. This is, of course, a harder question than just determining thresholds, uh, but we have some progress in that. Um, we see uh, that uh, what why is the wavelength 40? Again, we don't really know that, but uh, yeah, no, we don't know that. I'll just say that. Um, and over here, we start to have two bands when the Reynolds number is lowered sufficiently, a wavelength of 60, and that is reproducible. It, it is, really is two bands because this is periodic with that. So this is part of the same band. So we have two bands here, three bands here. So uh, when it, here it lost a band and this one is coming back to there. So why, why did it go from 40 to 60? And then finally, all this goes away. There's a lower threshold. How do we define it? And what is its value? Um, so uh, here I'm, I'm just showing you more uh, such series. This is a particularly cute one uh, here. Remember, it wants to go from 40 to 60, from three bands to two bands. It knows that at 320, but oh no, it lost two bands at once. They didn't confer enough. They lost two bands at once. So you have only one band, it's not happy with that. It wants to have two bands, wavelength 60, and you can see it's mad. It keeps uh, making little baby bands here, but none of them make it until finally one does. And now it's happy. It has 60, a wavelength of 60, it has two bands, and it continues until the Reynolds number is sufficiently low that that band dies. Okay, so um, now I'm going to tell you a lot about the mean flow associated with this turbulence. Um, let us take again a series like this. This is a series at Reynolds number 350. And in this series, I'm not lowering the Reynolds number. This is just kept, uh, kept stationary and there's fluctuations. This is turbulence. Um, and we are going to average over a time when the, when the turbulence doesn't move too much, like here it moves, so we can average. And we're also, and so we get these, um, we get these slices. We're also going to average over the x direction. Uh, let me remind you what the x direction is. Um, the x direction is this short statistically stationary direction, right? Where nothing is happening. That is to say, not nothing, this turbulent stuff, but it's not changing from turbulent to laminar. So we are going to average over time like this, and we're going to average over x, um, and this is what we see. Now, what is this? This is the uh, uh, flow in the u direction. The u direction, that is along the bands. If x is the direction along the bands, then u is the flow along the bands. And let me show you a little more of that. As I said, we have this, four this three space and one time dimension velocity field. We're averaging over space and time. We're subtracting the um, laminar flow. Um, and here we have, or the laminar flow or the mean? I think there was the mean, yeah. 
Uh, no, well, hmm. anyway, this is what's left, this, the deviation. And so this is flow that's coming out at you, blue and red. And what direction are you looking in? I remind you, Z goes from, uh, tur this is the turbulent kinetic energy. So this is a turbulent spot, a laminar region, a turbulent region. And so you can see these, the direction, uh, this is where the bands or the bands are uh, alternating in that Z direction. And uh, you're looking in the, um, you don't see this, uh, the X direction, you've been averaged over it. And this is the Y direction between the plates. And this is the direction in which you alternate between uh, turbulent and laminar. You see here the Z direction, but you don't hear, see the Y direction, which is between the plates. So we now have these two dimensional data sets, which is easy to work with. Um, let me show you more of what, what that mean flow looks like. You've been seeing it in this perspective in the tilted domain, but let me show it to you in the usual picture. Here, this is the top view, and this is a bottom view. This is, in fact, it's 0.725. The top is one, the bottom is one, y equals one, y equals minus one, at y equals 0.725. Y, uh, there's no velocity at the top and bottom because it's rigid uh, plates, but a little bit down from the top, you have these bands that are oblique with respect to the streamwise and spanwise direction. And you see this flow along the bands. That's the most prominent feature, the flow along the bands and uh, in the opposite direction uh, by central symmetry of plane thread flow in the bottom. Um, here is a picture uh, taken by Duguay, which also shows these the, uh, the mean flow um, superposed on the turbulent laminar pattern. You see it's going along the bands. Um, so, given how crucial this mean flow is, uh, Sebastian Gomez proposed to suppress this mean flow and see what happened. Um, how did he do this? He suppressed the large scale spanwise flow because you have streamwise flow anyway if it's laminar and if it's uniform turbulence, you also have mean streamwise flow, but you don't have any spanwise flow uh, like this. So, he, he suppressed. Um, the uh, large scale spanwise flow. So he's, this is an energy spectrum, and this is the large scale Z. The Z is the direction, well, anyway, the, he suppressed. So this here, which is associated with the large scales, this is associated with the turbulence here, this red thing. It's, prob it's, the, it's probably the length between the plates. And this is the length between associated with the wave number that's look associated with the length between the bands and in regular plain coed flow, you have it. And in the suppressed, suppressed case, you don't. That just shows the procedure works, okay? The spectrum looks like this with no uh, large scale flow. And here are two pictures shown from the regular plain coed flow and the, the one with the uh, bands, the band, um, along band flow suppressed. Here you see that they're not regular yet, you see, but you always see it here, the bands are kind of fighting it out, as you may remember from this picture here of the simulations by Duguay here, they're fighting it out, the different angles, they're not quite sure. Eventually they will align and be parallel, but uh, not yet. So here is, um, here they're, they're, the angle is right, the wavelength is right, but they're, they're at different, um, different way. And the, this is a very large simulation. This is a, these are the streaks within that little square. In the band-free one, the, the turbulence is not aligned obliquely. Okay, we say band-free, but what, it, what we did was not suppress bands. Uh, um, Sebastian Gomehi suppressed the mean flow. And what came out of that is you do not have the bands anymore. He suppressed the large scale flow. And so again, here are these pictures. Now, here are the kind of pictures I showed you before um, that he, he produced time and Z pictures. And here you see ordinary plain coet flow. Um, this is at Reynolds number 380, 335, 320. Here you can see a band. If this is a, an, an experiment, a numerical experiment, where you just start with a band and eventually it dies because 320 is pretty low. Here's 380 and you start with a little patch and it exp patch expands, and as it expands, it expands into bands. It wants to have bands. It does this spontaneously. There's no comb in there that's making it do that. And here in between, it's doing something called splitting here, where one band divides into two, and then also decay where the bands die, because it's an intermediate uh, Reynolds number where it likes to do that. It's kind of fighting between uh, splitting and decaying. 
Now, if you go, if you suppress the mean flow, so you don't you end up not having bands, this is what it looks like. Again, for di three different Reynolds numbers, you have, uh, you have a patch of turbulence initially, and then it dies. And then you have a patch and it, it's increasing. It's kind of happy to increase slowly. And then one which really expands a lot. Sometimes it's called a slug. And, um, but you see here, it looks like sand and here it's band. So you really, it's not that it doesn't make turbulence, but it doesn't make um, it doesn't make bands. Here's another picture which I give you to uh, introduce some uh, concepts. Um, this is now a picture like the ones you saw before. This is Z direction from turbulent to laminar to turbulent laminar, and this is the Y direction between the plates and the turbulent regions. Uh, you saw them before. You saw them here. They're like parallelograms, right? And so here they're like parallelograms. Yes. And here in the band free term, they're not, they're more kind of rectangular. Here you really see this thing that you get called overhangs where you have uh, turbulence here that faces laminar across the gap and turbulence that faces laminar. And here you have that much less. Now, this is measuring, uh, it's a little bit more technical here. This, this is a measurement of the turbulence sampled along a line, the kinetic, the turbulent kinetic energy, the turbulence, that's the purple, and the green, is this mean streamwise velocity? We're saying that the streamwise velocity is important. And here they are alternating out of phase 90 degrees. So it's like an oscillator. And there's an I, um, uh, okay, the band free does not have that. Basically, they're in, uh, they're in phase. Okay, one's the negative, the other, that doesn't matter. If you plot these against each other, the turbulence and the, you see in one case, in this first case, the regular PCF, you see a circle. Again, like an oscillator, like a two uh, uh, second derivative in time system. And here you just see a line or a curve. Okay, so now this, the reason I wanted to mention this is because this, is rem this reminds us of a theory that's been put forth for pipe flow. Pipe flow has kind of led the way in this turbulence research recently. This is uh, JFM Perspectives by Dwight Barclay, where he proposed a model, um, this is now, uh, yes, it's PDE, you have time derivative and X derivative, but it's one dimensional, one dimensional along the pipe. So along the pipe, that's kind of like along our Z direction. So here he proposed that there was, um, this is the profile in pipe flow, it's parabolic. And when it's laminar, it's like this. And we, it's well known that when you have turbulence, it's flat, it's blunted, you have a flat profile. It doesn't make a parabola or not much of a parabola anymore. So here you have the turbulence and here you have the flatness. And the idea is that uh, you have the parabola and because you have the shear, because the shear is what's making the turbulence, it makes turbulence, but the turbulence blunts the, um, blunts the profile. So you don't have shear anymore. So your turbulence dies. Um, but then after that, the it becomes parabolic again with the shear, so the turbulence comes, so that enables you to have this periodic in time or space, you know, here it's a traveling wave, for us it's just space, um, doing this to then this, then this, then this. And the uh, taking out the mean flow takes out one of the variables, you need two variables to do this, the mean flow, the or the shear, and the, yeah, we'll say the mean flow, the turbulence, the mean flow, turbulence, and here you only have this one, you have only one, I won't call it degree of freedom, but you see it's different. Um, and here's some more pictures of what's happening. This is low Reynolds number, medium, high a contrast between the bands and the uh, band free. Um, so Sebastian's shown, uh, this was his purpose that um, uh, turbulence is fine. You're not suppressing turbulence. It's practically the same Reynolds numbers. It's the patterning that needs the mean flow. And you can turn off the patterning by turning off the mean flow. Okay, now I'm going to show you a next item, uh, which is about Poiseuille flow. I've, I've used them kind of interchangeably a little bit. I'm going to now show you the difference. First, I'm going to tell you that the bands that you just saw in Coet flow also occur in Poiseuille flow. I remind you that uh, uh, that um, Coet flow is driven by uh, shearing between the plates and Poiseuille flow is driven by a pressure gradient that makes a parabolic profile. Okay, so it's, you have two plates, but you're pushing on them. And the first to see the bands in um, the in Poiseuille flow was Tsukuhara and his coworkers. And here's a picture from their 2005 um, article. 
Um, now, <clears throat> here's the same kind of picture we saw before, Z and time, but when, uh, but time also means Reynolds number, slowing down the Reynolds, uh, excuse me, lowering the Reynolds number. That's what we do in these experiments, we lower the Reynolds number. We start with uniform turbulence, and then we see bands appear. Now, I should say that this is done in the frame where the mean flow, or the, the bulk flow is zero. Otherwise, otherwise you would have to run and, and keep up keep up with whatever you were seeing, but you put yourself in the frame where the mean flow is. Uh, and by that, I don't mean the mean flow that I'm talking about. I'm talking about the basic, the bulk scalar velocity that it's going by. You impose no flux boundary conditions and to compensate accordingly. Okay. Um, <clears throat> otherwise you would see these things just zip by, zip, 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 zip. Um, so here you see, but you can see here that the bands do travel as they will for Poisson flow because uh, plane coet flow is symmetric in the streamwise direction, but the center, so what it's doing on top here, it's doing bottom there, so it has no reason to travel this way or that way. It's kind of stuck, whereas Poisson flow has this feeling of this way. I mean, it could have traveled backwards, but it has a feeling that this way is different from that way, and hence, generically, such things travel. So it's traveling here, even with respect to the bulk flow. And over here, you can see it changes over. Here it's going a slower than the bulk flow, and here it's going faster than the bulk flow. You also see, of course, the usual, um, the usual um, uh, wavelength here, and the usual increase of the wavelength as you diminish the Reynolds number. Um, here is the speed measured by a Gomez here, um, and you can see that for high Reynolds number, it goes, it's negative with respect to the bulk velocity, and for low, it is positive with respect to the bulk. This, uh, this figure also shows something else. It shows what's a good length to do this in, a length meaning the LZ, because after all, you could, if this band here sees another one, and another one, there they're not so free to just go at whatever velocity they want. So we can see that the, here, this is the length that's changing. And we can see that lengths like 25 are quite insufficient. And, but by the time you get to something like uh, 100, 100, 150, 200, uh, you're pretty much converged, at least by measuring this speeds. And, but you can see also they're very small. I mean, here that you see them because of course you do it to that scale, but they're really very small compared to the bulk velocity. You see here one in 2% or so the bulk velocity. Um, okay, so now um, I've just told you they occur in plane Poisson flow, but you may have noticed that before I was talking about Reynolds numbers like 325, 350 and stuff, and now all of a sudden I'm talking about Reynolds numbers like 1600, 1800. Oh, well, one of them's parabolic profile, the other one, you know, they're, they're different. Well, they're really not different, and I will tell you how that works. Here is plane Poisson flow with this parabolic flow, here's plain coet flow. If it's due to the shear, you can see that here in plain Poisson flow, you have two shear layers with opposite signs that are half as high. So really, Poisson flow, you can imagine it would be two coet flows, one here and one here. But then the counting is wrong because the usual Reynolds number used for Poisson flow is the half gap as usual, and then the maximum, uh, the velocity, the difference in velocity between the a maximum of the parabola and the zero at the plates. Uh, so that's written here. Whereas the Kuwait one is also given as the difference in velocity. Um, excuse me, it, the, it's given as half the difference in velocity and also half of this, the height of the sh this shear layer. And so you see that there's a factor of four between them. If you were to count them the right way, that is to say, this is a shear layer here, you would get a factor of four in the definition of the Reynolds numbers. Just conventional Reynolds numbers are four off. It's not, it, it can't, it's not exactly four because the profile is parabolic. It's not, there is, it's not, uh, it's not a, a pointy function and there is no wall in between. It's not exactly, but more or less. That is why the threshold for transition, the usual threshold with the usual Reynolds number in Kuwait is around 300. For Poisson, it's around a thousand. So it's not a factor of four, but it's more or less. And pipe is even more easy to see why, because pipe, the, the length that it uses uh, is not the distance between the plates or the radius of the pipe, which would be, excuse me, the half distance between the plates or the radius of the pipe. It's the diameter of the pipe. So there's a factor of two right there. And one sees it, the threshold of pipes flow is about 2,000. 
So when you see that, you now know why. Okay, now I'm gonna show you pictures of the mean flow. That's the same mean flow that I was showing you before. You may remember, um, uh, it's the real basic one, this blue and this red here. This is flow that's along the bands. Blue means it's going this way and red it means it's going that way, uh, right? This is flow along the bands. And so you're seeing it now again for, um, for Zoe flow. And you see the, um, uh, yeah, you see how it looks. This is how it looked for quick flow. It's been, um, this direction has been stretched so you see it more easily. It, before it was, it was realistic, stretched. Um, now, um, Let's continue. You see that they kind of resemble each other. Let us put a reflected coet flow. This is just to show you that it really does, or it really is two coets. Let's put, let's reflect and place this here. It's not exactly the same thing here because here the coet, you had a wall and now you have two. But now let's cut out that wall and put them together. And you see, it's really the same thing, okay? And I'll show you something else now. I'm going to show you the balance of forces in the U direction. The, the U direction is the direction along the bands. Uh, when you average in time, you no longer have a time derivative. Let's average uh, in time. We, we By the usual process, you turn this U dot grad U into U, big U dot grad big U, which is the uh, nonlinear term on the mean flow, and then the Reynolds stress, which is on the deviation, u tilde dot grad u tilde, and this is the Reynolds, the force that comes from the Reynolds stress. This is what makes it, this is the turbulence force. You're like, pressure doesn't play much of a role. We look at the force, this is a state statistically stationary, so these should add to zero. This is as we go in Z, as to say the turbulent region, the laminar region, the turbulent region, and they cancel. You can see this plus this equals this. Here you have no turbulence because you no green force because you're in a laminar region. And indeed, the viscous and nonlinear things cancel each other out. Okay. And then you return to turbulent region where they're of the same sign and they cancel the turbulence. Okay. So we can use the kind of things we can measure and probably and and um one can study the forces, and uh, Sebastian has done a lot of work on the energy balance there. Now I'm going to show you uh, the same comparison for, between Poiseuille and Coet. And this is pretty, this is, this is what you, uh, okay, so here you see the forces, the green, the turbulence, and the advective, and the viscous force. And here you see it for Poiseuille flow, and for Coet flow, Reynolds number 1100, Reynolds number 300. Those are about comparable for, the, um, uh, for these, these flows. And that's at a certain y, uh, that's y equals minus 0.725. And now let's go to the other side. And remember the symmetries of Poiseuille are such that the top is like the bottom. It's got symmetry in between the top and the bottom. Whereas Quet has center symmetry. If you go this way and now you reflect, you're going that way. Okay, and you see that. You see that as you here, you had to, when you went down in Y here, you had to change the sign of the red. You change the sign of the green, right? This is the opposite of that. That's the symmetries of it. Uh, but anyway, you see that these look really exactly the same. So it's really the same thing that's going on. Poiseuille and Quid are not different. Now I'm going to show you another flow uh, called Wallet flow by some, by others. It's called Kolmogorov uh, and other things. And we're going to take away the walls. Is this set in England? Uh, uh, the bicycle, look ma, no hands, right? Okay, so no walls, no walls. How can you be no walls? Quet flow, especially you're, you're, that's how you're making the flow happen. You're shearing the wall, you're, you're, sh you're pulling the fluid with the walls. Okay, the, uh, those uh, Swedish, clever Swedish people pulled the uh, film. Okay, but still that's a wall, they pulled something. And with no, no uh, walls, what are you gonna do? So this well F flow is a toy model plane quad flow. You have stress-free boundaries. You cannot penetrate uh, past these boundaries, but you can go parallel to it. You have stress-free boundaries. So what would make it go? Well, you have to put in a body force and you put in a trigonometric body force. And this is in fact how well F demonstrated his self-sustaining process. Uh, Kolmogorov flow is like this, except it has sometimes several different repetitions of the trigonometric uh, flow. Here are people who studied it. There's well F, of course, uh, Manville. Here's Cedric Bohm, our own Cedric Bohm right here. Uh, Chini, Gretchen, Julian, Noblock, this and that, that group. They studied well F flow. And why study well F flow? Well, 
um, it's got no walls. Um, what it has when it's um, uh, when it's turbulent. Okay, this is the flow, the laminar flow. When it's turbulent, the uh, wallet flow has a straight um, profile, unlike the um, PC uh, plane coil flow, which has to be zero at the boundaries. So it has these boundary layers where it's kind of absorbing all that delta U here and here. So you have to have these fast changes. But what we're going to do is we're going to use the well flow to mimic the inside of the plane coil flow, just the inside, naturally. And uh, when we do well flow, uh, I mean, it works. When we do well flow, we get bands just like in plain coil flow. And at the same Reynolds number, not exactly the same Reynolds number because you have to correct for these, uh, the fact that you've taken out these boundary layers. But uh, when you correct for it, you get the same thing. Not exactly the same. The, re the re Reynolds number range is big. Some things are different, but really it's a lot like it. So you don't need walls. And in fact, you don't need walls to study wall bounded turbulence. Isn't that strange? And I think this was shown by Duguay with me. What you need is confinement. You need confinement and you need shear, but you do not need walls. So all that talk about the law of the wall, that's all well and good. I'm sure it's very necessary. You usually do have walls and you better know what's happening near the walls, blah, blah, blah. But you don't need the walls to make turbulence. So this is very good uh, from a theoretical point of view to learn this, but also from a computational point of view, because you no longer need the, uh, the boundaries. Here is um, the boundary layers, which require a lot of, here is the plain coet flow. And you see here the green, the green says, we have to go back and be, uh, and make ourselves zero at the boundaries, just like here, right? We have to go and make ourselves zero at the boundaries. Um, so we have to put with that big, uh, that's a big gradient. We have to put a lot of points here, Chebyshev spacing, this and that. Um, but no, well, that flow, this is what it looks like. It's as if you took a scissors over here, this black place, and you cut right through the plain coet flow. You cut off the boundary layers and you get well flow. And it's slightly different, uh, but it's, as I say, it's not that different. Well, flow because trigonometric functions are so regular, you can truncate and get more regularity. There's, uh, we have something called model well flow where you truncate at only uh, four modes in Y uh, and that, uh, leads to, your, so effectively you have four points in Y, it's very big savings. And look, it produces bands too. Four points in Y, I mean, four modes in Y. Isn't that amazing? Let me, okay, so now I've told you about mean flow and well left flow and Poiseuille flow. Let, I have, my other two topics are about the lower and upper bounds of the banded region. So here is a kind of little diagram. For low Reynolds number, you have laminar flow. For high Reynolds number, you have turbulence. And we call this, it's not uh, uniform turbulence, where you don't have bands. And it's not just bands. It's in general, it's intermittency, which is any kind of uh, spatially dependent thing, bands, patterns, gaps, whatever. So here's a question. How low does the turbulence go? Is it continu a continuous or a discontinuous transition? Uh, universal, this was question was asked by not, in the famous 1986 paper by Pumu. And I'm going to show you a kind of a picture of something. And you see here, this something is making, um, the, the black stuff is turbulence, the white is laminar, it's thresholded, so that uh, that's why you just see black and white. This is actually a simulation of model well left flow, which we believe to be practically the same as plain coet flow. Quantitatively, it's not, but qualitatively, it is. And the features I want you to notice are that the the bands remain. You don't get just little guys. They don't, the bands remain and they're the same size pretty much. There's just fewer of them. So it really wants to make bands. This is Reynolds, you can see it's it's not very turbulent. It's getting low in Reynolds number, but it a band and it remains. Not regular bands, but it has bands. You see they have an angle. They, they look like they don't look like a banded pattern, the thing you're used to seeing if you've been following this field, but they are oblique bands. Um, so now our question, is this transition discontinuous or continuous? If you look at the turbulent fraction, that is to say how much of this space is black and how much is white, um, um, do you make an abrupt change down to white or is it continuous? Can you have an arbitrary amount of turbulence? So let me show you some 
uh, simulations or that are less thresholded or with colors to recall the minimum flow unit. Uh, remember that thing of uh, Gibson of Wallef is uh, from the channel flow code Gibson. This is two by four by six. So that's the minimum unit that can sustain turbulence at all. Now let us, um, this is a, this is a, uh, this is a domain that can make turbulent bands that has to be bigger than the, uh, um, than the minimum unit by a lot. This is a, but that's not big enough for us. That, that domain that I was just showing you, it takes up this little space here. So the, the, um, the Gibson, this, this from the Wallef uh, thing here, this thing, this is one row, one streak. This is the height, remember the, the, this, and this is the, um, uh, yeah, though that's the streak distance, so it's just two, but you know how, how, how we had to get big, we had to get, get 780 and so on, but now we're really much bigger. We're 2,500 by 2,500. That's very big. Previous simulations and experiments were in domains of this size. Okay, that might not matter here that you can get bands, that's okay. But look what happens as you lower the Reynolds number. You are going to think that you have nothing, that you have no turbulence at all because uh, it's getting sparse. This turbulence happen, uh, disappears by going sparse, not by being everywhere and being weak, but by going sparse. And you can see how you would uh, think that the threshold had been attained when it hasn't. So the previous uh, uh, people really accepted this, naturally enough. Experiments, Botan Chate, 1998, Brittle Corporate Rounds number 323. You get out 2010 numerics, they match 324. Um, you know, so that looks really good. It looks as though you have the threshold. And in fact, it, it's quite close to the threshold. Uh, that is, you do have the threshold, it turns out. But it looks quite discontinuous. But it turns out, and this is shown in our paper, our, our JFM Rapids 2017, uh, using the model well flow, that it is continuous. Okay, now it's not merely continuous. Uh, one is used to from bifurcation, they were saying square root dependence. This is not square root, this is a 0 0.58. Uh, one can do a log plot and see that. And that is the uh, expected uh, exponent from um, uh, percolation theory, universal, universal thing, physics thing, which I was not involved in before. Now I just accept that this. This is 0 0.58, and that's a prediction from uh, things that are much more universal than fluid mechanics. And here's again some movies. This is this is again simulations, threshold simulations of model well left flow. This is above threshold, and this is a curve. You see, it's going to go to some constant percentage of uh, turbulent fraction here. I mean, it's not going to be in the same place. It's twinkling, but it's going to be. It, it, you don't quite see it, and this is logarithmic, so this is going to get slower and slower. You have the constant percentage here, and here it's just the, uh, near the critical Reynolds number. I'm going to one of the predictions is that it goes down by this law in time, and you see it's disappearing and disappearing. But the the bands don't go away; they just are more sparse. Okay, now here's another approach to determining the threshold. And this is from Philosophical Transactions, uh, Sebastian Gomez. Um, and this uh, is a, an approach that has been used before in recently in pipe flow in 2011 and plane coet flow in 2013. And this is a crossing of curves. What curves are these? I'll tell you in just a moment. They found, this is Avila et al. They found a critical run of 2040. And that's kind of the first reliable determination of the critical point and 325 for coet by uh, Avila et al. There's, that's again that factor of um, uh, that I showed, told you about because uh, they use different Reynolds number definitions. Okay, so what are these things? Well, this is a time series. And this, is a, this is the decay of a band at low Reynolds number, low for plain Poiseuille flow, 870. Um, and it can be shown or can be surmised or something that the probability of decaying by a certain time is uh, exponential like this with an exponent that depends on, excuse me, uh, an exponent, no, a, uh, a rate that depends on the Reynolds number. Um, and so we see this here, we see this exponential law. This is the decaying of, this is the probability of decay. As you wait longer and longer, you have more and more likelihood that it decays. Once it decays, it's not gonna come back. So once it decays, so there it is. And with Reynolds number, this slope, which is this thing here, goes up. 
And this is also uh, the same thing, but for different Reynolds numbers. And the reason there are two, two graphs like this is because here it goes up to 8,000. Okay, these are pretty easy to determine. But this, you had to go to 100,000, and you're nowhere near really getting a good slope for this green. The high Reynolds number requires long times because decay is rare. No, excuse me. Uh, low Reynolds numbers. Yeah, sorry, low Reynolds numbers is what I meant. I think I must have switched them. Uh, well, okay, you'll see this, you'll see what I mean in just a second. I think I may. Okay, this is another kind of event. This is a splitting event. I told you about them before. Um, again, this is probabilistic how the time, the probability that you will see a split at, uh, as a function of time. Uh, as for different Reynolds numbers. Again, you have different slopes for different Reynolds numbers. Here, uh, with Reynolds number, the slope goes up. It's very negative here. And here, too, you have a long time. This is 100,000 advective times. You need a long time uh, because this is rare. Okay, so you put all those slopes together and you get this diagram. This is the rate, that thing in the exponent, the rate of decay or the rate of splitting as a function of Reynolds number. And you see, indeed, that rate goes up as Reynolds number of the rate of decay goes up uh, here and down here. And you see where the, and the idea is that the crossover is the threshold. But we haven't, there's no data here. The times are too long. You get to 100,000, that's really a long time, isn't it? Here it is, and we don't have any data. So that's not very good to have no data where your theory holds. So there, Sebastian did this very difficult thing of adaptive multi-level splitting. Um, so what, what did it do before? It's called Monte Carlo. Everybody knows Monte Carlo is a fancy word for, let's just do a bunch of cases until we run out of money. And then we take the average and the statistics. Adaptive multi-level splitting, you encourage the rare things to happen and you correct for the probability. Encourage, what does that mean? Um, you clone cases that furthest, furthest, what does that mean? This is all extreme events theory. You probably have heard these words. They're very fashionable. You can regard it as a form of magic. You're getting more rare events by measuring something. So, oh, it's almost there. Let me continue him, him, I won't continue. And you do that. And by doing, and it's very hard. <laughs> it's very hard to do. Uh, but you manage to get more data. And this is the data he got up in this range where he couldn't get any data before by the adaptive multi-level splitting. Uh, we also know that the, a uh, plain coet flow was fairly easy to determine here. This is times, and these times are not, this is times of, uh, I think it's 10, this is 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, I believe, and that's where the splitting is. But here, we're up to 10 to the six, uh, ten to the 7, and this is not um, something that's affected, at least I don't think so, uh, by that uh, argument that I gave you before. Maybe it's just intrinsically harder. So that was the lower threshold. Uh, the upper threshold, how do you define the onset of patterns? How does it go from uniform to bands? Okay, so here is something I did uh, a while ago in our, um, well, a while ago. This is plain coet flow, 350, 410, 500. Here you have banded uh, uh, flow here. You saw this series before. It's the one that I averaged before in time to get the mean flow here. Here is uniform. You see there's no bands. And here's intermittent. It's kind of going into bands and not. And now I'm going to take a, a Fourier transform in Z. So I'm integrating against, look at that as integrating against a sine wave. You see that makes a lot of sense here because this is where you have the black and here it's where you have the white. And here you would tend to get zero. So this component, this one component, the component in this with this wavelength is approximately zero. That's that's on the left end here for the uniform flow. And it's a it's wiggles. This is there's a lot of averaging here, but it wiggles, but it's pretty much. It's good value, good finite value for 350, and 410, it wiggles a lot. Now we look at these as probability distributions, um, and here they are. This is that Fourier coefficient for three different Reynolds numbers, and you see that for the uniform one, where you don't have zero for that coefficient, the most likely value is zero. For the other two, you see that, um, you see that it's moving off, and for the banded, the most likely value is finite. Now, if you plot excuse me, the most probable value of the, these, these probability distribution functions as a function of Reynolds number, you see that the threshold is about 430. This is where uh, bands first appear. Here is another way to do it that was done by Sebastian in a recent JFM. He said that you have gaps that form. This is different Reynolds numbers going down. You see the gaps forming. And he measured the lifetime of gaps 
And he saw curves like this. He saw, sees it's continuous, but there is a change in slope. So something's happening here. And then he measured the um, uh, see if the, 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 the drag here. And it's, there are these features at 430 and 470 where, so we defined, he defined that one threat, 430 is when you have patterns, you have patterns up to 430. You see a nice kind of wavelength here, don't you? And then 470 is when you have gaps. Uh, and then after that, you can be said to have uniform turbulence. And he made this kind of diagram that says uh, that for wavelength is usual kind of wave, uh, stability diagram that you have Reynolds number uh, um, wavelength and the most likely wavelength with the lowest Reynolds number is around 40 uh, indeed. Um, and the threshold seems to be about 440. And he did this by extracting all kinds of measurements. Another recent thing in this, uh, um, uh, in this field is by Kashap Yuge Dosho. Uh, this just came out uh, maybe, I think 2024. And here, what they did was they took uniform turbulence, they put a perturbation on it with different set wave numbers and at different Reynolds numbers. And they see the perturbation decay. Here's decays. And from that, they got decay rates. And they took a lot of averaging and this, because after all, it is a turbulent flow. They got decay rates. And here they're but here they're plotting the decay rates as a function of Reynolds number for three different wave numbers. And here, the decay rate as a function of wave number for three different Reynolds numbers. And you see here that you have a positive growth rate here. So it's like a linear instability. It really looks like it in some average sense. So that's really nice. And then the very last thing I'm going to say is some work uh, that is uh, submitted recently by Benavides and Barclay. It is an extension of that work where the, remember I said the mean flow and the turbulence and the mean flow and the turbulence, an extension where you don't just have one spatial dimension, you have two. And here are pictures taken from this model. And it uses this model while F flow with the difference that there is a, a field that represents turbulence and it has its own evolution equation where things like the production and the dissipation and this are taken from physics and from integrating the model well left flow. And that's the end. Thank you very much.